Good morning and welcome to West Worthing Baptist Church. As most of you know, Hazel is on holiday this week. And so whether you're going to church uh, on Sunday morning at 1030 or watching on YouTube or listening on the website, I'm afraid you're stuck with my voice today. And because she's on holiday and there's, uh, there's, uh, there's all these different services, um, this video will be taken from the midweek service that we had this week. Now, the midweek service happens via Zoom every other Wednesday. And we usually have a series based on one of the books from the Bible. So right now we are having a series on James and this week we got to James chapter 3. So what you're going to listen to a little bit later is going to be taken from that James chapter 3 um, reflection that we had on Wednesday. Everybody is always welcome to the midweek Wednesday services. All you have to do if you're not already receiving the link is let me know. Uh, send us, send me an email or, or phone me and let me know that you would like to join the Wednesday midweek services. Here in this place with the people who watch together with us every week, we come to worship the living God. In God, we hope. In God, the creator of love, we live in Christ the way we rejoice here on this day of gentleness and beauty. In the spirit, we find our path. In the teacher of hope, we learn to serve, to serve God and to serve one another. We begin today with a reading from James chapter three. The tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, says James, full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this shouldn't be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace, reap a harvest of righteousness. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, O God, my strength 
and my Redeemer. I think that could have been the message of today's passage from James. Here in James, we find wisdom within the New Testament, an almost proverbial thinking from James, who doesn't write as poetically as the more ancient wisdom writers, granted, but he's not any less applicable to life than many of the verses that we have from Proverbs. Consider some of the following Proverbs and how they convey very similar notions. Sin is not ended by multiplying words, but the prudent hold their tongues. That's in Proverbs chapter 10. And then in Proverbs 17, 28, we find even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongue. I feel like it's a bit too late for me. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And then Proverbs 13, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Next, we have Proverbs 15, verse 4. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. That's very much what James is talking about, about something that can be easily destroyed, something great which can be easily destroyed by simple words, like the ship analogy, which I didn't read, and the forest analogy. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. We all have experienced that. The argument, which wasn't so bad and wasn't so big, but quite annoying. And then with one thoughtless word, we turned it into a raging argument. Gracious words are honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. And fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Well, there we can think of a, a lot of um, examples of this. We've all been guilty of enjoying airing our own opinions, especially when it comes to politics. We all like to air our own opinions. Um, I probably should have kept that one away. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. That's from Proverbs 12, verse 25. But if we look back to how we got here through the epistle, which most of you didn't catch, um, but those who have been coming to the Zoom midweek services have, we begin to notice a pattern that culminates here. Now we have done the first couple of chapters and have now reached the, the third chapter. In the first chapter, we heard about how James talks about being doers and not just hearers of the word. And he defines doing the word not as people who pray a lot or who go to church a lot or who have some kind of personal individual purity, but someone who acts the word to others in their relationship with others, behaves a certain way toward other people, lends a hand, doesn't deceit, doesn't deceive, doesn't lie, doesn't commit sexual sins against other people, etc. And then on the second chapter, he talks about partiality, not treating people any differently because of what they have or don't have or what they do or don't do or their stand in society. And we talked about a Baptist civil rights pastor who marched with Dr. King, but then one day realized that God doesn't necessarily hate the people he hates, even if it seems right, because God doesn't hate anyone. And so he went on to take funerals for KKK members um, 
and and try and reach out to to people who were completely on the other side of everything from him as hard as it was and if you want more information on that and who i'm talking about please let me know now we find all of this about the tongue about confession and not setting the forest blaze with a single word about blessing people if we bless god about speaking with gentleness and never from a place of ambition using words that foster peace and gentleness and never hypocrisy and partiality so we see a pattern throughout james so far and what james it seems to be telling us through chapters one two and three combined he seems to be saying something about the nature of the gospel's power there's a great transformative power in the message of the gospel of christ there's a great power that gives life and defeats death and to james this power seems to not be contained in a type of individual living it's not a unilateral power it seems to be a relational power the gospel changes people yes it does but it does so by enabling them to live in healthy relationships it grants us a more fulfilled life by calling us to live in peace with other people by calling me to defend my neighbor's right before my own and then calling my neighbor to defend my rights before his or her own and now james is telling us that if we live this gospel part of what that means is that we will control our speech because the tongue he claims has a power greater than we know we know that words can be trouble we know that words can be very hurtful we know about teenagers who have sadly committed suicide because of what was written about them in social media we know that with something as subtle as simple words people have suffered emotional and psychological and even spiritual abuse people have been driven to anxiety and depression and self-harm because of what was said to them or even about them people have, can be manipulated into acting against their will by words that drip into their ear day after day and i'm sure we are all being called to keep this in mind and never use words as weapons to hurt somebody or even try and get away with things we have done however james isn't really speaking about the extreme here he's not simply talking about bullying and manipulation he is reminding us that even in more subtle ways words can break relationships that we are meant to keep in this lifetime if we do not nurture a gentle heart in the way that we speak and deal with people out of the overflow of the heart said jesus the mouth speaks the good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him jesus is talking about how if there is something in your heart then it's going to come out and that's very obvious and that is how Jesus, James goes back to nurturing gentleness and peace in relationships. It's not only what we say, it's what is inside us. If we can nurture ourselves into being gentle, peaceful people, then we probably will end up being able to speak words that um, are gentle and peacemaking. We're back to chapter one and two in a way faith is good but it's nothing if it does not manifest into some kind of action here 
gentleness and love are good, but they don't really exist unless we talk like it. If what overflows from our hearts are words that show how quick to offend we can be and how slow to restrain ourselves we can be, then the self-sacrificial love is probably not there. Because to remain silent is often a show of self-denial. We don't like to remain silent very much. Some of us, myself included, we like to have our, to say our piece. We like to say what we mean. We like to say something when we feel that we've been wronged. But there is a, a, a self-denial in holding back, denying ourselves the release of feeling better from hurting another person because it's that hurt toward others is not worth our release. We deny ourselves when we remain quiet. The chance to appear wise, to sound very knowledgeable in order to not humiliate somebody else. James finishes this chapter with some profound words about wisdom. It turns out wisdom isn't just that thing we left behind in the Old Testament, that thing we read poetry about and think it sounds very nice. It's embedded in gospel living and it has everything to do with living in community, which is how we live the gospel in community. Where there is envy, and selfish ambition, James says, there is also disorder and wickedness. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. If we want to be righteous in the sight of God, we listen to the very practical advice that James gives us. We sow seeds of peace. We, may, we make peace with everyone that we can. We speak words of peace every time, even at our own apparent detriment. And James says, when we do so, Understanding that living the gospel is living in community with other people. Understanding that when there is gentleness and love and peace inside of us, that is how we will speak. Well, then we will sow a harvest of righteousness when that happens. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain. Blessed be your name. 
Let us pray. Lord, we confess how much we are like those first disciples of Jesus. Our cravings for more and more toss us about like leaves in the fall wind. We boast of our great wisdom, yet we don't understand your ways of peace and gentleness. We do not always plant ourselves in your hope and in your grace, and so we sometimes reap harvests of disorder and conflict. Draw near to us, gracious God, and forgive us. Draw us into your tender arms and teach us peace, gentleness, the willingness to put others first, the wisdom to serve instead of seize, so we might bring forth a harvest of righteousness, justice, and peace. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now may the God who gives us peace make us holy in every way and keep our whole being, spirit, soul, and body free from every fault at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.